All right, let's get started. Welcome, everyone. It's nice to see you. Did you all enjoy your winter weather last week? It wasn't very wintry after all that, but uh, hopefully you enjoyed the break. Um, real quick reminder for those of you in the class that uh, tonight your, uh, your events or critiques are due, okay? So make sure that you get those up on Blackboard by midnight tonight if you haven't done so. I did take a quick look and it looks like most of you have done it, so thank you so much for that. Um, as a quick reminder, next week we have Transition of Style. We're doing a live podcast taping. Uh, it will be with the founders of the Taylory, so it should be a very interesting conversation. So mark your calendars for that. And I know we have a lot of guests, so welcome today. Thank you for coming. This is an exciting day because we have a very iconic fashion designer with us today, John Anthony. It's such a pleasure to have him. And I don't want to tell you too much because we're going to get into his story a little bit as we go throughout the day. But uh, I can tell you that John has won many awards, including two Cody Awards, which is the same as the CFD Awards today. He actually graduated from FIT, so he's an FIT alum. A few years ago, right? <laughs> Just a few. Um, he is recognized as one of the top designers in America of American fashion. He still runs his studio today in Haute Couture and has a very interesting perspective of both the history of American fashion, his own perspective as a designer, and sort of the world and the lifestyle that he worked in. So I'm so excited to invite John Anthony up on stage with me today. Thank you. Welcome to FIT. should be ready to go. Okay. All right. Terrific. Thanks again for coming. It's such a pleasure to have you. Yeah, my pleasure. <laughs> I, uh, I want to start, I mentioned in sort of my brief intro, and I didn't want to say too much because I think there's just so much that we can talk about today about your career, but uh, I did mention that you graduated from FIT. So let's start there because I think that's, that's uh, of something that everyone here in this room can relate with. Tell us a little bit about that. They're going to think I'm a dinosaur. I went to FIT in 1955, and it was not this building. It was a small college on the top of a high school, and we were 130 students. But we learned very well, and um, graduated in 1957, before any of you were born, I'm sure, and um, just loved what I was doing and decided to pursue and go further. So FIT was uh, fairly new at that time. What drove you to come to a fashion school? Was that something that had you were interested in as a, as a child in design or something that? Well, I was always interested in theater and I was always interested in, in clothing. And uh, it was very, very interesting because at that time uh, here at the, I don't know if they still do it, at the Fashion Institute, you had to go into the industry and work for four weeks with some top um, manufacturer. And um, I did go to a coat and suit house because my love was always tailoring. Coats and suits were always my favorite things to do. Anything that was engineering and tailoring and precision and putting together. I was always more interested in what went inside the garment as opposed to what came out of the garment, but the results were always there. And um, I went to a company who were one of the providers of this school called Zelinka Matlick. Um, and you know in those days on 7th Avenue, each building stood for a certain specialty. For example, 550 was considered the couture of the garment center. 530 were dresses, 512 were coats and suits. So I made the trek to 512. And I had to work with a designer who gave me her sketches and I had to put the muslins together. And she came in with a red pencil and she went, do it again. Okay. She made me do it three or four times. I thought it was pretty good. I hated her, but I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> and then finally, um, I didn't see her again until I received the Mortimer C. Ritter Award from FIT. And she said to me, well, I knew you had it, but I just wanted to make sure. Isn't that mean? <laughs> it's really mean. <laughs> so that started the way up. 
and FIT really was sort of the center of, as you said, the Seventh oh, Avenue that used to exist. Oh, it yeah. certainly was. Yeah. It certainly was. And um, uh, the classes were great. The instructors were great. And uh, it was it was funny. I, mem I remember when we used to eat lunch out of, on the roof because there was no other place to go. And there was no air conditioning. And uh, the one teacher I had wouldn't let us take off our jackets. And there we would be draping, sweating. But, you know, we did it. Well, FIT made sure it was extra warm today, just yeah. so you would feel at home then. <laughs> <laughs> and here it is, this wonderful school, which we're all so fortunate to be able to come to, which is all the backings of, of a college and all the different courses that are given, which at that time did not exist. No. So what made you go into women's wear then? If you were, you, you mentioned theater and you also sort of mentioned a love for sort of the inside out and how things are engineered. What, what led to dresses and, you, and women? You know, it's, it's, it's so hard to explain because what your heart wants and what you think you want and what you desire doesn't always happen that way. You fall into situations. And uh, what had happened was, I, I loved doing coats and suits, but, um, I only had two jobs my entire life. And the first job w was with Coats and Suits, and I was there about eight or nine, no, I'm sorry. First job was with a dress house, and I was there about eight or nine years, and they made $23 dresses, if you can believe it. And I was very successful with them. They went on to the stock market. But I was feeling depressed with myself because it wasn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to make beautiful clothes. And at $23 in those days, you couldn't make beautiful clothes. So then um, I went on to another position. And there I was noticed by the buyer of Baumwitellers at that time and Bergdorf Goodman. And they saw what they liked. And Anne Klein, who was a designer on 7th Avenue, she was with a group that were putting designers, up and coming designers, into business on 7th Avenue. And she was very successful. She wanted me to go on my own. So in 1970, I did. And um, formed John Anthony. And uh, I'm sure you know the story. The first collection that I did uh, received the Cody Award from the fashion industry. And it's this funny story, and I was, I was trying to explain to you that sometimes we don't know why the things happen that happen. Two weeks, three weeks before the collection was to premiere, my first premiere collection, it was stolen. It was stolen from a truck that was delivering it to a theater where it was going to be photographed. So all of a sudden, there we were in a premier collection going to open up, and there are no clothes, none. So what did we do? We had the patterns, but we didn't have the fabrics. So I decided to do the entire collection in black. Well, not only did I win the Cody Award, but the New York Times at that time said, what a young, brilliant designer to do the entire collection in black. So that's what I meant when I say sometimes you just don't know. You just have to go with it, right? There it was. And black, black happens to be my favorite <laughs> color, but still <laughs> black. And that was funny how that happened. Yeah, I was going to ask that. So did that become kind of core to part of your identity as a designer early on then? Yes. And so from there on, it just, it, it just went on and um, other, other wonderful accolades as I went along. But um, always worked with interesting people and nice people, and, and learned so much through many mistakes and through many wonderful things. Met wonderful people, wonderful, and still going. In the 1970s, so you started in 1970 your own label. This, this, as we look back on it, became sort of the heyday of American fashion with Halston yourself. Yes. Um, can you describe a little bit about what it was like to um, sort of coalesce around this new American vision for style that happened in the 70s? Yes, well, we were, uh, uh, I would say, six or seven designers that were constantly 
and the pages of Vogue and Harper's and whatnot. And it was Jeffrey Bean, Halston, John Anthony, um, Oscar de la Renta, I, I would think. But we were continuously promoted and promoted. And it was a time in fashion when fashion was, was uh, very important. And you had the ladies in fashion who made couture what it was at that time. Jackie Onassis, CZ Guest, I don't know if you know, well, I know you all know Jackie Onassis, but I don't know if you know uh, many of the other women that were in that time. But, uh, <coughs> and they promoted fashion, and, and the papers and magazines promoted the people that wore fashion. Then, of course, you had people like Audrey Hepburn and um, other wonderful stars that came along. I mean, even Marilyn Monroe, uh, in a way, promoted fashion. So it was a great time with great people, uh, great writers, great theater, great fashion. And, and it just was so inspiring because all of this was going on at one time. And then, of course, we had Studio 54. And then, if you had a business, which I did, and in those days, we had buyers. And buyers would come in from all over the country, even from Europe, to see John Anthony or whomever the designer was to uh, purchase their clothes. And of course, the first thing they would say, and because I was on the celebrity list, was, could you get me into Studio 54? <laughs> so there it was, you would be working during the day, showing collections during the day, making clothes during the day, and partying until four or five in the morning. It sounds so refined. It was the great. <laughs> it was great. I'm it, sorry that Studio 54 <laughs> is not here now for them. Because you see, those are things that help you design. Those are things that make you design. How do you get your inspiration? How do you learn? You have to see. How do you acquire taste? How do you know what's good and what's not good? How do you know if you, as a designer, are doing the right thing? Are you doing the right thing? Why are you designing? For what purpose? Just to make a pretty picture? For the red carpet? I don't think so. I don't think so. You're designing clothes because you feel a need. It's something that you love. It's something that you, that you want to get involved in. I have to tell you that in the 50 or so many more years that I'm designing clothes, every client that came to me whether she was a celebrity, whether she was a society woman, or just a lady that was coming in for a coat, suit, or what have you, I personally fitted each and every one of them. I didn't let assistants do it. They stood by me. The person who was working on the clothes stood by me. But every pin that went in came from me, so that the results or what I put into that garment. The only other designer that I ever, I had the pleasure of meeting her, was Coco Chanel in the 1960s when I was a student. She was the only designer that I knew of or had learned who personally fit each client herself. And all I'm gonna tell you is it makes the difference because your hands are involved. The pins talk and how you do it is what's in your your hands. There's such a lovely picture. I know you can't see it of you actually fitting a garment on, on one of your clients. Oh yeah, and I wouldn't I wouldn't let them leave unless I saw them on on, on them because my name was in it. Mm -hmm. It's what I lived for. It was what I loved to do. To, and there was nothing more rewarding. You know, when people say to me, well, what is your success as a designer? You've, you've, you've designed for famous people. You've done Broadway. You did this, you did that. There is only one way to judge your success. When your client comes back to you again and again and again, like one cl client who come to me for 30 years, then you know what? You must be doing something right. Think about that. You must be doing something right. It was a real, it still is today, a real connection between you and the client, not just in terms of the clothes that you were creating for them, but in terms of the conversation, I'm sure, that you were having about where they were going in that dress and how they wanted to function that evening or the event that they were going to. 
how, did, how as a designer did you uh, sort of build that repertoire of, of being able to, to build a, a dress that would work perfectly for that woman's well, life? Well, I've always felt that there must be a sensibility to clothes. And you, you have to, I always ask questions when a client would come in because I as a male can tell you that if I'm going to an occasion or I'm going somewhere and I don't feel that I am put myself together, I have a horrible evening. I don't enjoy it. A woman feels that, if not more, to know that her hair is right, that her makeup is right, that the, the dress that she's fitting. I've had women come in, I want a backup. I want a backup. I mean, you learn so many things and, and you have so much fun when you work with clients. That's the, the greatest joy in working one-on-one -on -one with a client because you get to feel their pulse and you get to know them. Uh, I have clients who will call me and say, I, I need a dress. Do you want me to say, no, 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 you, you know what to do, you know what to do. And it works, it works. You mentioned sort of the connection in the 70s that happened between theater and art and dance and Studio 54 and all of these things, um, which was something I think that was quite unique at that time. Um, can you describe a little bit about how that created sort of the sense of fashion and the sense of New York that hadn't yes, existed up until yes, that point? Yes, at that time, disco was the rage. And fashion that occurred at that time was phenomenal. Diana Ross was greatly contributed. She had such chic and such style. Now that's something you have to know about. You have to know about style. What is style? What is chic? What makes something chic? You have to know about proportion of clothing. Where does a button go? Where does a lapel start? Where does it end? You have to learn about fashion, you have to learn about chic, but what you need to know, or you should have, is the eye to see when something is wrong, when something is perfect, when you can compliment your staff and say, a work of art, it's perfect. And at the same time, to be able to say, for example, we would do about 100 pieces of clothing and the staff worked night and day. I had a staff of 40 people. And I would say, well, we're only gonna show 30. But Mr. Anthony, we made 30. We're going to show 30 of the best pieces. Because when you do a fashion show, it could be very boring. And if, and if they don't get your message in the first five, six pieces that come out, then there's no message. You've got to remember that. You must be your best editor, your best editor. So, how do, how do we know chic? How do we, how, do we, how do we get chic? Going back to disco, the girls looked fabulous. The, the, the boys looked wonderful. Bell bottoms were in, the hair was the rage, and dance was the rage, and, and just putting things together was wonderful. I have seen on the subway, the best girls coming from the Bronx pull together like you could not imagine. And as Chanel had said, fashion comes from the street. It does, it does. But you have to have the eye to realize that and to know how to pull that together to make it work. You started in ready to wear but shifted more to couture and made to measure. What, what made you make that change and- um, From ready to wear? Or ready to wear, yeah. Okay. Um, because the clothes in ready to wear had to be made by factories. And when you had factories, some lots would come in good, some lots would not come in good. And I always didn't like that. And when you did pieces where you were going to put the pant with the blouse or with the jacket or wh whatever you were combining it with, if it was made from one maker, it looked one way. If it made from another maker, it looked another way. I said, enough is enough. I want to be completely in control. I want it all done under my eyes. And Jeffrey Bean and I were the only ones that decided to leave 7th Avenue and go up to 57th Street, open up salons, and do just that, which we did. Well, and that was, again, um, 
sort of unheard of really in America, this idea of having a couture made to measure house. Um, how, how was it to sort of open that here in the United States to take away business potentially from, from the houses in Paris and, and to really set up in a, in a unique way here in New York City? It was, it was wonderful. I mean, it was doing what I love to do. You know, I don't like fashion. I love fashion. I don't like making clothes. I love making clothes. That's the difference. You have to love this business. If you don't love it, you might as well leave the theater right now. You have to love it. You have to make mistakes and learn. What inspires me, people so many times, is what inspires you? Fabric inspires me. I'm wearing a double-faced cashmere jacket that has to be almost 20 years old. But you know what? I love the fabric. <laughs> the fabric is, is wonderful. It's just delicious. It stands up. It's beautiful. You could do anything with it. It always comes back to life. Fabric, for me as a designer, talks. Fabric is my inspiration. Fabric tells me what to do. And I've always been very, very fortunate in sketching and designing. I've never, ever had to struggle comes out of me like water from a fountain. So I'm very blessed to have that. And I was always able to do a collection from AM to PM with no problem because there always were designers that specialized only in evening wear, only in, in this, only in that. No. I showed a collection from AM to PM and it was always with a theme, with a purpose. I always, I don't do collections anymore. I stopped that in, in the 90s. But you need a theme. You must inspire. You are going in front of the press. You are going in front of the public. And they're going to do this, and they're going to do this. And in my time, you had to be very, very careful. Luckily enough, I always had good reviews, so it was OK. I have a feeling from what you said earlier that a lot of that is in your ability to edit and curate you and must think edit. about that. You must be your own person. You're the designer. You're, the, you're in charge. How do you think I could last all these years if I wasn't doing the right thing? Why would they come back if you're not doing the right thing? It's you. It's you who are expressing yourself. If you are the couture clients, uh, uh, students, I'm sorry, if you are the ones designing the clothes, Oh, for God's sakes, get out there and design them. Do what you feel you want to do. Be your own critic. Be critical of yourself. If a, if a, if a coat that you feel that you put on paper doesn't come right, sketch it again. Sketch it again. Then when you put it into muslin, if it's not right, do it again. But when you put it together and you put it on the mannequin and it doesn't look right, get rid of it you've wasted your time. Nobody at school tells you that. <laughs> you have to find that out for yourself. But it's in those mistakes that you learn, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have had the opportunity to really work in this industry through, I would say, two or three major, major shifts. First of all, sort of going from the 60s into the 70s, and mm -hmm. then the 80s, and then the 90s, and, then the 90s, and now we're, here we are today. So, so you yeah, have four major shifts. I'm just curious, um, you know, first of all, you, you're still designing today, you're still being creative, and I'm, I'm curious if anything has changed for you throughout those years, or if in fact, sort of the tried and true methods that you started upon, you know, in the, in, in the 60s and 70s, are what you still go back to in terms of your, your, how you, your process, your creativity. I never go back, and I'll tell you why. Because each decade, is a different expression. And it may not be an expression that you're fond of. Well, you better like it, baby, or you're not gonna be in business. <laughs> you adapt yourself to what's going on. You keep up with the times, but you do it your way. Just do it your way. If you don't like long skirts, I never was a lover of long skirts, but I did them and had great success with them. Just do it your way. How do you choose as a designer where to put, especially as, a, as somebody who's working one-on-one -on -one with clients, where to put your time and energy? Because in so many ways, 
a designer is creative, they're a business person, they're um, in many ways having to have a relationship with the society, the society women that you're working this for. How did you know where to put your time um, and effort so that you got the best sort of return, so to speak, on your investment? Because it was only, you had a whole team, but this was your name on the door. These were your clothes. And it's always you who are involved. Exactly. You could have 100 people working with you, but it's you that they want. The client comes in, she wants the designer. It's no, no, no two buts about it. It's a 24 hour day. I was always in at six o'clock, 6.30, and the last one to leave, 9.30, 10 o'clock. And then you had to go out socially. Mm -hmm. And that was your, because you had to build the name. And you know, the greatest advertisement for the name is the results of the clothes that you make on the women who wear them. The results is your greatest advertisement. But you still have to be in Vogue, Harper's, and all these publications that are out. But they come to you. If you're on the right track, and you're keeping up with the times, and you're doing what's out there that's needed and wanted, they, they come around. They find you. They do find you. I was very impressed, and so we've had a few conversations since the first time we, we connected, of just this very strong sense of who you were as a designer and where you wanted to go. And, and unfortunately, in many cases, the streets are sort of littered with, with examples of, of great designers who sort of lost their way, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm even thinking to a small degree of, of what happened with Halston in the early 80s. And, yes. and, and I'm curious, how did, how did you sort of see these massive shifts that were happening, especially early 80s, towards more mass-produced clothing, um, the media explosion that we saw on television? Wh what were you thinking back then and how you were going to stay well, on top? you know, I was always rather abnormal. I never smoked. I never took drugs. I was never into that scene. I married 60 years. I have a 56-year-old son. I have a 27, 28-year-old grandson. And I always had a family life. Not so with these designers who are all great designers and all friends of mine. They led a different life, and it was a different time for them. But for me, I, I was square. I thought I'd go away. Being square sometimes pays off. <laughs> but I'm around, and none of them are. That's all I could tell you. <laughs> So looking back, uh, um, you know, from your vantage point today and looking sort of at fashion as it is and, and sort of where we are, you've mentioned you always have to find the things that, that you can love in whatever decade. I'm curious, what are the things that you love in, in sort of where we are in fashion today? What, what gets you inspired about fashion that keeps you uh, in this trade? Well, you know, when Cole Porter, and of course you all know Cole Porter, you know his music, when he wrote Anything Goes, he was way ahead of his time. <laughs> because today, um, anything goes. An evening gown with a baseball jacket, um, cutoffs with a fur coat. I mean, I've seen all of that done. And you know what? It's OK. But it's how you do it, how you pull it together. Do you know how to pull it together? how to give it chic, how to make it look smart, how to make it look that when you walk in the room, the woman walks in the room, all heads turn around and say, damn, she looks fabulous. <laughs> it's how it's done. It's just, if you have that inner ability to, to bring forth and come out, uh, and I'm not saying it always works, it just doesn't always work. But you could make it look wonderful. I mean, I don't know where I saw My favorite movies, especially for couture, have been films of the 1930s. The chic, dumbest movies, but the chicest clothes were always on these actresses, like Joan Bennett and Greta Garbo. Beautiful clothes, beautifully executed, beautifully made and very, very, very inspiring. They've always been inspiring for me. Um, from there you get ideas, from there you, 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 you learn so much. There's so much to learn, and, and you just can't 
put it in a bottle and just say, well, I'm going to do it all today. It's, it's all these years of, of experience of ups and downs and good and bad and in and out. But you, if you love it, if one of you emerges from what I'm saying today, I'll be very good, feel very good that I'm here today to inspire you because it's a lot of work that you have to love it. And if you love it, you're on your way. We were talking a little bit before you got up on stage about how, unfortunately, uh, sometimes uh, American fashion has been forgotten or some of the great designers, uh, especially from 50s, 60s, and 70s, are have gone. are gone. Um, are there any ones that you sort of look back on and still are very inspired by or ones that students should look at as they're in America? Yeah, that are in their education and thinking about how they can continue on this legacy. Okay. Do you know the designer Norman Norell? Did you ever hear of Norman Norell? Okay. Well, Norman Norell was America's greatest designer in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. He passed away in the 70s. And at that time, there are so many stores that have closed stores that you don't even are aware of, who sold wonderful, wonderful merchandise. And one of those stores was Bonwood Teller, where the Trump Tower is today. And um, what was I saying? Just inspiration, American designers, Norman yeah. Norell. And Mr. Norell made the type of clothes that I love to do, coats and suits and tailored evening gowns and blah, blah, blah. Well, in 1972, he suffered a stroke. And the presidents of Bergdorf Goodman and Von Mutella came to me and asked me to take over the house of Norman Norell. Of course, I was greatly honored, but I was only, what, 30 years old? And had a baby at home and a wife who didn't work. And I was kind of scared to do it. And in those days, designers did, designers were, did not come out of the closet because designers worked for manufacturers. It was John Anthony for Zelinka Matlick. It was uh, uh, Donald Brooks for Townley. The designer was kept in, in the back. He didn't come out. And then it was an era when the designers in the 70s started to come out. But I just felt I couldn't do it. Not that I couldn't design it. I just didn't, because I just received my first accolade, the, 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 the Cody Award, and then to go into something like that, I was not mentally prepared for it. So I refused it, and I didn't do it. Oh, I, di I didn't know that. Yeah, now you know. There's a <laughs> lot you don't know. <laughs> there is. It's, we could go on for three or four there's hours. A lot, there's, <laughs> a, there's a lot my own daughter-in-law doesn't know, or my son, for that matter. <laughs> but, you know, it was a long career. So I, I want to go back uh, sort of uh, 80s. There was a lot of shift. And um, I'm curious sort of what took you through um, that shift as a designer, especially around the, the red carpet started to become a thing with Giorgio Armani, sort of the Italian re-renaissance, so to speak. And I'm curious sort of how that was for you as, as that whole shift happened in America. Well, you know, I don't watch the Academy Awards. And the red carpet to me is not couture. The red carpet to me is show business. And if you think that the red carpet is the road to, to, to couture, it's not. There is a difference between glamour and sex. And many of the things that you see on the red carpet exploit sex. Very few pieces come out with glamour. And there are very few artists who deliver glamour. Audrey Hepburn delivered, definitely delivered glamour. And um, oh, so many other wonderful actresses that delivered glamour at the time. Greta Garbo was another one. Uh, oh, I can't even think of another time. But they looked glamorous, they were glamorous when they walked on, on, on the run, or red carpet as you call it. Uh, they looked glamorous. But you don't have a lot of that anymore. And there are not many glamorous films that are made anymore. There are the, the, the movies has changed. Uh, the, the actresses have changed. Years ago, 
it was an actress and you heard about her again and again and again and again. Today you see an actress one or tw once or twice and you don't see her again, except that there are the exception of a few artists that you do see, like Meryl Streep, that you do see going on and on and on. So it's a different time. And they have to adjust, and it's not easy. They have to adjust to that time. But if you want to make beautiful clothes, clothes, then you have to stick to what you do and try to build a clientele. It's very hard. I try to get into a store that's willing to see your designs. You know, do a group of eight or nine pieces of clothes. You don't need more than that. Because if what you have to say is there, it'll be recognized. Believe me, it'll be recognized. What more can I tell them? I'm curious what keeps you, you're still designing. What keeps you going today? Um, what makes you want to still touch that fabric, you know, create something, work with clients? You see, that's another problem. Unfortunately, many of the wonderful, fabulous fabric houses that were in America no longer exist. So you must make the trip to Europe, mainly Europe, to find beautiful fabrics. I've always found the most exquisite fabrics in Italy, the most beautiful laces in France. Uh, and that's about it, mainly Italy for, for my, my purpose. And I've always bought very expensive fabrics. I don't think I've ever purchased a fabric under $100 a yard. And I've, I've, I've purchased fabrics at $500, $1,000 a yard. So it was always, I never cared about the price. I just cared about the results. And unfortunately, that was my, my, that was my era. Never caring about the price, just the results. Everybody's gotta have a bad habit. <laughs> that was a pretty beautiful habit to have, I think. I'm curious um, how, as a designer, especially working one-on-one -on -one with clients, how did you figure out how to create a business out of that in terms of what to, to, to charge a customer? I, it's, it's so difficult sometimes as I'm a creative person expensive. to do that. I'm very expensive. You know why? First of all, if you're going to make a group of clothes and you're going to have a clientele come to see you, I know you're all very young, but people go by impressions. Impressions mean everything. And all my career, I have insisted on the most magnificent atelier that I could possibly have. And I had them, whether they had spiral staircases, chandeliers, 20-foot ceilings, I didn't care. You wouldn't go to a garage to buy a Rolls Royce. So you couldn't come to me to find beautiful clothing in a dismal, dismal atmosphere. And I say that for the woman who came, because there were always Rolls Royces parked downstairs while they came up. Presentation was everything. The way you present the clothes on mannequins, the way you, you, you present yourself with the person that comes in, I always had a platform, a special stage built. And she would come in and I'd have her stand on the stage to make her feel like a queen. And then we would do muslins on her, we'd fit in her. I had shoes brought in, I had jewels brought in. We, we had everything to make her look and feel a million dollars. Of course, that happened many, many, many years later. It didn't happen when you started. But if you do go into business, and if you f are fortunate enough to find someone who believes in your talent, who believes in what you do, and is willing to back you or put up the money for you to have that type of atelier and that type of, of, of pizzazz, then you know what? That's more the power to do it. Do it simply or do it elegantly because that woman is coming in to buy a coat from John Anthony for $15,000 in cashmere has to have the right surrender, okay? To come for a $30,000, $35,000, $40,000, $80,000 wedding gown for you know who, that has to have the proper surroundings. 
I don't think I've left out anything. I think I've given you as much as I could possibly give you. I think we should open it to questions then and just find out, should we? <laughs> <laughs> so if someone can grab that mic just so that uh, we can hear the questions. Ah, questions and answers. <laughs> now I'm on the spot. <laughs> this is where it gets really tough. Okay. All right, here we go. Make sure you flip up the switch. A little louder, I can't hear you. <laughs> can you hear me? Okay, you can hear me. Um, you so you said that they asked you, they approached you about uh, Norman Norell taking over the house. Um, do you ever? I didn't understand. I didn't hear. Oh, can I'm sorry. Yeah, once you're done, I can make sure that we answer that. Oh, okay. okay. Um, do you ever regret not taking over uh, Norman Norell, the house? Um, obviously, you've been very successful, but do you think a lot of things would be different if you had done that? whether or not if you had taken the job at Norman Norell, how your, your life would be different or if you've ever thought about that? Probably. Probably. I would be torn between two worlds. And, 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 um, and it's a funny thing that living today is Mr. Norell's mannequin, Denise Linden. She's um, a very good friend of mine. I only spoke with her yesterday. And she was with Mr. Norell for about 20 years, and she always says to me, you jerk, you should have taken it because you're the only one I know that could have done it. And you know what, I probably could have done it, but when you're young like that, I don't know, maybe because I had a family, I, I, don't, I don't know. But Thank I, you. I, I, I could have done it. I, I was flattered and honored that he even wanted me to do it, so. That was very nice. Thank you. Up here. Hi. So when looking um, at your website and your portfolio and everything, I noticed that your garments are very stunning, but they're also not like simple in a easy way, but they're not overdone. Like they're very, you're very like strategic in how you design. So my question is, at what point in your design process do you usually stop yourself from over-designing or like adding too much to a garment where it kind of just takes away from well, the Well, um, what you've seen here is uh, years, a few, a years, that a different type of thing. Um, but you know, I've always been true to myself. And um, I've always kept the sensibility there. And I think that's so important in, in, in designing because that's your signature. Mm -hmm. that's, it's not that I'm kooky this season and weird next season. And, and then after a while, you don't even hear from those designers. You don't even know where they are or, or, or what happens. He said earlier, what happened to them? Mm -hmm. I've always was true to myself. And as I said to you, you're the designer. If you really love this, and if there's something you want, then you have to do it. You have to do it. The school can only teach you foundation. How to drape, the bias, straight grain. Wonder, I used to love to drape and do muslins. In fact, up until several years ago, they had my muslins here because they kept, every pin was about a half inch apart. Every, you know, it was just the way I did things. It was the, my, my way of doing things. But to drape was wonderful. To, to cut into the fabric was wonderful. To put the muslin was wonderful. To put the finished, not the finished, the, the basted. I always basted, because you always rip out and make sure that the sleeve fits right and that she's comfortable in it. <coughs> Comfort is so important. Simplicity is so important, and the result is elegant. Mm -hmm. It's elegant. You mentioned that you allowed yourself to ma make mistakes and learn from them. Okay. Is there, is there any one particular mistake that you learned the most from, or uh, it, particularly when it comes oh, to I'd design? I make some dogs. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> of course, you make mistakes. Not everything you put on paper or everything you 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 execute in fabric comes out. I must say my average is good, <laughs> that, that I have to say. But there are times when you try to experiment with certain things 
um, and it, it doesn't it doesn't happen. So you try either you try again. But I know one thing: if you don't see it when you first put it on the the girl, the mannequin, in its originality, in, the, in the, your first concept, if it I always say if it doesn't sing, get rid of it. Instead of potchkeying with it and trying to fix it adding this to it, or maybe we could put this on it, maybe we could put that on it. No, no, no. I remember one fashion show that I did here uh, for a group of kids, I don't remember what it was, I'm gonna get you up there. <coughs> and um, of course you know you're the designer and you want everything to be shown the way you want it, but if you want the right attention on it, then you need the proper eyes to go over it, not to criticize it, but to edit it and to say, well, I think the skirt should be a little shorter. Not to be offended, you do it a little shorter. There's a reason that someone who has an eye or who is a professional is not to put you down. I used to get so upset when someone would say something to me about the garment because I felt it had to be that way. But I learned from my mistake. Another question. I'm sorry. Just seeing if we have another hand. I thought I saw one up here. What a boring crowd. There are no questions <laughs> I would have to there ask. There we go, right here. <laughs> what was your favorite era to design and the most fun you had? Who was my favorite designer? No, what was your favorite era to design in terms of your clients and women that you were working with? What era? Uh huh. Seventies. Absolute seventies. You don't have any of it here, but if you saw the clothes of the nineteen seventies, of which I received all those accolades for, they are. I, I can't even believe that I did that. There was it was all. It was actually sportswear, is what it was. Chiffon blouses, and I never put brassieres on. I never put underwear on. They got in my way. I always wanted to put clothes on the model as she would move, because I could sell it. We did see-through chiffon blouses. We d matched with silk crepe de chine pants, tied with suede sashes, and all different elements of fabric combined, uh, all monochromatic, all dramatic, and all wonderful clothes. So my favorite. There was such a wonderful sense of just naturalness back then, even with all the pizzazz and... <laughs> I should have been in the theater. <laughs> did, you, did you see the a documentary well, on Studio 454 that just came out? Yeah, it was you <laughs> have to love it. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I, I speak to you with my heart. It's something that I, I, I grew up in. I remember that I used to, I had, cr believe it or not, Crayola crayons. And I remember sitting in the kitchen table and using all of my mother's napkins to make s drawings of dresses on paper napkins and Crayola crayons. She used to get so upset because all the napkins were used up. <laughs> but it was a beginning. It was a beginning. As a kid, did you used to look at fashion magazines? Or I mean, what was, what was sort of the initial inspiration to get into fashion? What magazine? Did you look at magazines as a child or were? Um, no, did you no, I didn't. No, I, I, I didn't. What I did was um, I would go to museums and always old movies. Old movies were, were always an inspiration to, to me. You know, to see uh, uh, Greta Garbo in a, um, a beautiful j silk jersey nothing evening dress with a raincoat thrown on over it, with epaulets and everything, and, and tied to one side. It was so chic, and it brought forth something that inspired me. And it was always things like that, 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 that. And then I had to go into mediums that I never used before. Fur. I, I never had worked with fur before. They don't show you how to work in fur in school. You know, in fabric, leather and suede and so many different fabrications that came my way at that time. And um, I did it. 
that was part of the fun of the 70s, really, was all these new fabrics that oh started yes. to appear. Oh, yes. Yeah. That was when I was really in the, in the, in the throes of, of, of the couture. Yeah. It's when they really inspired me because it was just so wonderful. And, of course, I was very hot at the time. And because of that, everyone was jumping on the bandwagon to, to get those, those pieces. And I have, I still have, Clothes from the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and 2000. And all the ads and magazine and all through that period. So when I die, you can go and look at them. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever see women wearing your pieces um, today that sort of yeah, catch you by yes. surprise? And yes, it's just absolutely. What is that like? Yeah, they are, they are many, the majority of them are timeless. They are timeless. I must say. I mean, a strapless evening gown is timeless. You don't need shoulder pads. I think we have at least one more time for one more question. If they're okay, right there, perfect. Hi. So you spoke about how you like why you wanted to open your own salon. Um, I was wondering what problems you faced in that experience. Sort of the problems that you had to deal with in, in creating the salon? Well, the floor wasn't done. So we worked on the floor <laughs> up until the opening. We then got engaged to architects and contractors. So it was done for less than two days. <laughs> so we were crazy, but it ended up triumphant. Did you ever find that collection? Did it ever surface? Did, did it ever show up again, that collection that was stolen? No. Congress spent so part of a brilliant move on this young design to do the entire collection. Sometimes creativity comes out of <laughs> the strangest places, right? Sometimes the dress that you don't like, that you, 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 you're not really crazy about it, becomes the most famous, the, the, the most, this is the dress I did. In lace, the blouse to here, the long sling, wrapped and draped in the front. The navy blue lace. Mrs. Clinton wore it. This one wore it. That one wore it. But we just couldn't get enough of that dress. <laughs> <laughs> You've given so much uh, good examples of your career, you, you've given good advice. I'm curious, sort of in closing today, what would, what would be supporting words? To, we have a group of all designers who are ready to go out into the world to become, uh, to work in this industry. And then, you know, it's a very difficult industry to work in. What, what bits of advice would you give them as they, as they leave today? Well, we are up against tough times, but it's always tough. make it wonderful, and you could make it fabulous, but do it. Don't let anyone say you do it. It's tough, but do it. If you do a little brief, go work at the Pope. Tell them, I did a little bit to work a little bit to see. Get someone interested. Be able to produce stuff that you yourself could not produce. You have a on someone's door and ask if they're looking for a designer. Have a portfolio that doesn't look like a birthday cake. A <laughs> portfolio that looks like clothes that you've designed, that you can present. That these are clothes that you believe in. These are clothes that you would like to see hanging in a store. These are clothes that you would like to see on young women or women's bodies. You have to get yourself 
Really, you have to do it. Nothing comes to you. You've got to go and do it in the beginning. I don't say it to discourage you. I say it to inspire you. Nobody pushed me. Nobody told me. I failed. I made mistakes. But I got up again. And you will do the same. Just do it. Make one of these. And, and I hope that you have um, <coughs> instructors who can guide you with that type of thing to help you. To, to, to know what should be in the portfolios and what you should be saying. And always present your best. And not everything you do is fabulous. There are some that are good, some that are not so good. But use your mind. If you think that these are better than that, you can put those in. Edit it. Learn to be your own best editor. Now I'm getting a sore throat. <laughs> Time to go. Thank you so much, John Anthony. It was such a pleasure to meet you. Truly an icon. Thank you.